uh, Dr. Leonard Nurse with us today. He's been out to Stony Brook a couple of times before. The first time was about two days after Irene went through. We didn't have any power or anything here. And uh, he's had a little bit of a rough trip on, on this visit too. So be attentive, be kind. <laughs> Dr. Nurse has his PhD from, from McGill a little while ago, a little while ago. Uh, and the focus of his research has been on uh, uh, climate change and particularly the impacts of climate change on small island nations. And that's what he's going to be talking about today. He's um, located at the Cave Hill campus of the University of West Indies in Barbados. And he looks at adapt adaptation, uh, mitigation, uh, human impact, human um, effects on, on climate change issues. But he's also perhaps his clone or someone in another life has worked on coastal processes, uh, beach erosion. You served us for a time as uh, the coastal zone management director in Barbados. But more recently, he's had a long-standing relationship with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, and is the lead coordinating officer for the chapter on small island states. And I think that book, as you said, is coming out be the latest version will be published soon. Uh, he's worked with the IOC, the Intergovernmental Ocean Oceanographic Commission, uh, the World Bank, UNESCO, and a, a host of other uh, international groups. So, Leonard, we're very glad you're here, and he'll be talking today on global climate change. What are the projected risks for the Caribbean? <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for the warm welcome, Henry, and the invitation to talk to you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today on some of the work that we have been associated with, with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and I've been concerned primarily with some of the projected risks and impacts on the small island states. The main small island groups being, of course, the Caribbean, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean. Um, Caribbean and the Pacific Indian Ocean, the Caribbean, and there are some in the Mediterranean as well, because we also include in that grouping um, Malta, Cyprus, etc., because they, lots of the impacts are similar in those um, areas. Um, as Henry said, in a previous life, most of my doctoral research, for example, is on coastal processes. But as you all know, we never end up doing what we study. So you look for something else to do, <laughs> and you pretend that you know a little bit about it. So that's, this is what I've been involved in in the last 20 years or so. So hopefully, um, you'll get something, you'll get something useful out of it, hopefully, by the end of, of the um, seminar. Um, well, what do we know? Well, there is quite a lot of uncertainty and a vast amount that we do not know. There's quite a bit that we do know. We now know, for example, that there's hardly any disagreement among serious scientists about whether <laughs> the world has become quantitatively warmer or whether the global climate system is changing. Of course, there's still a concern among congressional Republicans that whether or not this is the <laughs> But never mind. Um, we know that those things are true. And we also have some reasonably good evidence to support it. We know that from observations based on the instrumental record, which show, for instance, that net radiative forcing of natural agents, primarily um, solar FX, sulfate aerosols from volcanic eruptions, um, solar flares, etc. We know that that effect is small compared to the effect of human-related activities. And we also know that in the last 100 years, the net effect of the forcing by natural agents has been one of cooling. Contrastingly, what we're seeing is warm. So we know that what we're seeing is being forced by some external additional stimuli. And it is not something that is natural. The skeptics will tell you, of course, that um, there's always been climate change, there's always climate variability, so this is not new. 
but we know that all of these natural driving stimuli are what essentially should have caused cooling. Um, if we look at this graph here, um, that seeks to attribute some of the costs. When we separate out, for example, greenhouse gases, the impact of greenhouse gases, natural greenhouse gases on their own, this is the graph we get for the increasing temperature. When we look at solar influences, well, not much of an increase. When we look at the impact of ozone, same thing. And when we look at volcanic eruptions and sulfur aerosols from volcanic eruptions, we notice uh, this is not pointing. Well, it goes and comes. The volcanic, the sulfate aerosol um, from volcanic eruptions actually are showing a downward trend. That would have produced cooling. When we look at sulfates, totally, again, we see there's a downward trend. In contrast to natural greenhouse gases in the occurring in the atmosphere, and then when we look at both the modeled, thanks, when we look at both the modeled temperature increases, as well as the observed values, which is the solid black line, you can see that the temperatures are the increasing temperatures are largely driven by other forcings and not these, this group, which is the natural um, variability. We also know that the key greenhouse gases, you're not seeing this properly, um, probably use some, the wrong colors, but three of the key greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide and you can see the change and uh, the percentage change in these really key gases pre-1750 which is before um, the, around the, before the industrial revolution and by 2000 based on the IPCC's work. Um, in the case of CO2 the concentration, the tropospheric concentration has risen from 280 parts per million to about 392.6 parts per million, a change of about 40% over that time. In terms of methane, from 700 parts per billion to 1,874 parts per billion. And in the case of nitrous oxide, from about 270 parts per billion to 324 parts per billion. Well, anybody who thinks that um, you change the atmospheric chemistry by that magnitude and expect nothing to happen, um, probably live in a little bit in a world of a dream, um, most people would expect some kind of feedback, usually in this, in this, or this particular case, positive feedback. So that, that's the reality. In terms of even the, most, the more recent past, if we look at some of these gases and carbon dioxide, for example, in the very recent past from 1978 to 2010, um, nitrous oxide, methane, and CFC-12 and CFC-11 we can see the changes that have been occurring in these gases, these greenhouse gases as well, the newer greenhouse gases. The difference in these graphs, however, if you compare the CFC group with the nitrous oxide, the carbon dioxide, and the methane, you'll notice that these are going down. And of course, you might know, you would be aware why these are going down compared to these, which are continuing to climb. The reason, of course, is something called the Montreal Protocol, which has been able to put a global agreement to put a cap on these gases and replace them. And as a result, they're stabilizing and in fact, decreasing. But all the others um, are continuing to increase. In terms of global mean temperatures, we've seen that rapid increase occurring from about um, the 1930s, 1940s, very, very steeply up to about 1940, 1950, and then from about 1960, very, very steep increases thereafter. Um, so these are real trends. This is based on observed temperatures. These are not anybody's models. These are not figments of anybody's imagination. These are, this is from the instrumental record. And of course, it may just simply be a coincidence, but it just happens that the warmest 14 years in the instrumental record on the warmest 14 years on record all bunched between the period 1990 and 2012. So could be coincidental, but we know, however, that you're seeing this consistent increase and in rising. And that, again, again, based on the instrumental record. 
Um, since the IPCC's last assessment, which was in 2007, the fourth assessment report, um, work has been done which actually pushes that boundary and has shown even more steep um, increases. A group referring and uh, calling themselves the Copenhagen Diagnostics, people from Harvard, um, Stanford University, Cambridge, the um, UK, Met Office, Hadley Center, et cetera, the Hamburg Climate Group, um, and they've shown what I want you, what I intend to show here primarily is this rather steep, you can see these fluctuations through time from the different models, but look what the models actually agree that since 1750 after 1800, this is what has been happening. Extremely steep rise after the, um, centuries of this occurring, this kind of fluctuation in this ballpark. Now this is precisely what we're seeing. And the question is, is that natural? Um, why, what is the cause of that very rapid increase um, in the recent past? Again, as I mentioned before, just a few graphs to further illustrate the point that CO2, methane, and nitrous oxides um, are, are increasing very rapidly. Um, the rates of increase are higher and considerably greater than they have been at any time in at least the last 10,000 years or so. And how do we know that? We know that from I score data, um, which is reasonably accurate, plus or minus a couple of hundred years. And those data coming from, um, again, from measurements from the instrumental record, we know that those are increasing. All of this has been coinciding with large decreases in Arctic land, land and sea ice, um, the projections for that. And between 1980 and 2006, in the Northern Hemisphere, this graph represents that decline in Arctic land and sea ice over time. So that coincides with this rapid increase in warming which you saw at the earlier end of the previous graph. Concurrently, global sea levels have been increasing as well. And the IPCC put together from all available records, the record for sea levels using the, um, the paleo records as well from 1817 back up to 2003, showing um, that change relative to the 1961 to 1990 mean. Um, the red part of the graph, this piece here from here to here, shows you is the reconstructed sea level from all available sources. The blue section from here back to here is from tide gauge data since 1950. And the black part of the graph, this, this very steep section here, is from um, satellite altimetry post-1992 when that, that technology became available. And you can see that all of them point in the same direction. The trend is consistent. Um, satellite altimetry, as you know, is deadly accurate, almost down to centimeter accuracy. And you can see that this increase consistently occurs. So we don't believe that we're dealing again with something which is an artifact. We believe that we're dealing with something here that is quite real. Um, the projections are that we could expect a maximum sea level rise of about 5, 59 centimeters higher than the pre-industrial mean by about, um, 20, by about 2070. And the current projections are that by the end of this, this century, global sea levels could be as much as 1.5 meters higher than the pre-industrial mean. And this is based on the IPCC fourth assessment report. Um, work by the Ramsorf and the group at Stanford University suggests that to get a better sense of the trend, you probably should push the um, boundaries further out to about 2300 beyond um, the current century. And what they have shown, which is consistent with the findings of the IPCC, is the increasing trend. But what they've, what they've also shown that um, the, the Projected increase is likely to be higher, somewhere between 1.5 to 3.5 meters. Um, these are the boundaries that they suggest, so that the, the Copenhagen Climate Diagnostic Group are projecting a slightly higher increase 
than the IPCC. In fact, they suggest that the IPCC has actually underestimated the projected increases in sea level. So that's the global scenario. So let's come right back down to the area in which I work. What does this, how does this stack up with the Caribbean? Or rather, how does the Caribbean projection, how do they stack up with the, um, the global changes? Well, similar trend. Um, the observations which and the projections we make are consistent with the global and hemispheric um, variations. The models we run, primarily the ICAM for the, the German Hamburg model, the UK Metaukis model, Hadley Center for Episode 4, um, the, climate, the Canadian climate model, the Japanese high resolution model, all of them show this consistent increase for the Caribbean for air surface temperatures over the next several decades. Um, between 2110 and 2039, between 0.5 to 1 meter, 2040 to 2069, 0.8 to about 2.5, and then about 1 to about 4.8 between in the period 2070 to 2029. And for rainfall, most of the recent model runs, as well as the observational record, suggests a consistent drying trend in the region for most parts of the Caribbean region. And I'm focusing here on the insular Caribbean, the archipelagic states of the Caribbean, primarily. What is also projected is an increase in hurricane maximum wind intensity of at least 5 to 10 percent between before the 2050s. That is also projected. Let me pause here for a minute to indicate, however, that the jury is still out in terms of tropical cyclone numbers. You will see in popular literature and journal, um, newspapers and journalists and so on may frequently make the comment that scientists project an increase in the frequency and intensity of tropical cyclones and hurricanes. No IPCC publication will ever tell you anything about an increase in frequency because the jury is still out on the numbers. The models do not consistently project an increase in hurricane numbers. What they consistently project, however, is an increase in intensity, particularly those at the higher level, category three, four, and five systems. So not so much numbers. Um, some work that I'm involved in with a colleague, um, John Charlie, um, and I was discussing this this morning with Hamid, um, some of this work for some modeling that we've been looking at for temperatures and rainfall over the Caribbean for a project we were, we were working on. For the present climate, we are talking about the present climate up to about the 1970s, 60s, 50s, and 60s. The future, we're talking about 2050, 24, before 2050, 2040, and on. And what this, just to share with you a few snippets of some of the um, initial model runs, in the present scenario, it shows that the number of days with temperatures about 30 degrees Celsius are up to about 200 per year, in some cases in, in the northern archipelago. But what we project um, is that by 2050, or before 2050, the number of days with temperatures about 30 degrees Celsius or above will climb to about 300 or so, out of 365 days per year. Now obviously that has implications for things like cooling, air conditioning, etc., evaporation, and so on and so forth. And when we look at what we refer to as extreme temperatures, which are days, the number of days with temperatures equal to or in excess of 35 degrees Celsius, currently in the Eastern Caribbean, there are no days with temperatures. Those temperatures occur in places like Texas and so on in the summer. But in spite of the fact that we are tropical all year round, we never get a day when the temperature is 35 degrees Celsius. The constant sea breezes and so on, we never get those daily temperatures. What is projected by the models, however, in the future state is that come 2050 or so, we can get as many as 80 to 100 days out of 365 days where the temperatures can exceed 35 degrees Celsius. So we're seeing this represented in terms of not just the mean temperature, but also in the number of hot days that are occurring as well. Um, the recent hurricane threat in the Caribbean is something where taking a quick look at. Um, the 2004 season was one of the worst on record. Um, that 
In that season, there was something like over four billion US dollars worth of damage. Um, in 2005, there were 27 named storms, 15 of them became hurricanes. Um, that was an, an unprecedented four of those reached Category 5 status. Never before has that happened. Um, and it's happening now with a greater degree of frequency. The most Category 5 you've been accustomed to is two. And this is going back to the 1800s. Um, between 2000 and the end of 20, 2000 and, between 2000 and 2010, that decade experienced more Category 5 systems than any other um, decade on record. You had eight in that one decade. Category 5 we're talking about, which are very, very rare. You had Isabel, Ivan, Emily, Katrina, and Rita, and Wilma. You actually had four of them in 2005. And then in 2007, you had two as well. You would have been full, very familiar with the destruction which they wrought, particularly Katrina and Wilma as well. Ivan, in fact, was one which devastated many Caribbean islands, including um, Grenada. Grenada was growing at a rate of about 7 to 8% previous to Hurricane Ivan. And in the space of six hours of when the hurricane passed over the island, it plunged the island's economy into reverse and it has been in growing by, well not growing, receding by about two to three, minus two to three percent ever since up to the current. So, and that's a, so when you talk about vulnerability of islands, to put it in perspective, you experienced Hurricane Katrina in um, New Orleans. But the rest of the country hardly felt anything, and it really didn't matter. The country carried on as though nothing happened. In the case of Hurricane Ivan, that affected the entire island of Grenada. All 21 secondary schools were devastated. Um, the CARICOM countries took the school kids in, and to finish the, um, the, the equivalent of the upgrade 11 and 12 in many of the other um, territories for that year, 92% of the housing stock was damaged, 85% of the hotel stock was damaged, etc. So when you talk about vulnerability, vulnerability in the context of a continental scale industrial developed country is vastly different from vulnerability in a small area. So you only took the space of six and a half hours for Hurricane Ivan to have devastated and set back an entire country. Unlike Wilma and Katrina, even though very devastating, localized in the context of a large country like the United States. Um, similarly, some of the work which um, the Hadley Center in the UK has been looking at, along with um, NOAA here and NASA, is this increasing trend for some of these tropical cyclones to develop at slightly at lower latitudes than one would expect. Now, generally speaking, tropical cyclones tend to form of at least 10 degrees north and south of the equator, for a very good reason. They require Coriolis motion to give rise to the formation of the vortex. So without vorticity, you're not going to get a tropical cyclone occurring. Between zero, and that is at the equator, and 10 degrees north and south, that is why you tend to get, you get very few tropical cyclones occurring there. However, Ivan and a succession of hurricanes have been occurring at latitudes 8 degrees, 7.5, and so on. And that is worrisome because in many countries, which generally in our regions, in tropical regions, which do not experience tropical cyclones, ordinarily are now beginning to experience them. Guyana, for example, has boasted, Guyana on the South American continent, has boasted for years that they're hurricane free, they're out of the hurricane pass. Well, they better rethink that. The island of Trinidad, to Trinidad and Tobago, the same thing. But as they begin to form in lower latitudes, almost defying physics, um, it's becoming very difficult and con um, concerning for a number of climate scientists. And we also have the case where Wilma developed from a tropical depression to an intense category five in something like, that was actually not 24 hours, that should be 48 hours, so in two days. Typically, the lead time for that kind of development would be um, having that would be, you talked about sometimes four to five days, sometimes up to a week. But you have this intense period of in 48 hours, movement from a tropical depression to a hurricane. And this 
And, and I, I chose um, Wilma because this was the one, the case in which um, the speed was um, extreme. But this trend is also occurring. And the extent to which one can physically link this to the global, the, the warming that we're seeing is not clear, but work is ongoing. And there's a very, very strong suspicion verse, um, based on first principles that that is, in fact, now beginning to have an effect. And we're seeing more research um, occurring in that area. Um, just a quick um, table to show part the economic impact of um, in 2004 hurricane season. Um, in that year, you had hurricanes Francis and Jean um, causing losses of about 551 million US dollars. Um, hurricanes Ivan, Jean, um, Tropical Storm Jen, Ivan, Hurricane Jen, and, these, and all of these together in 2004 caused um, a total of over 4 billion US dollars in damage. Now, this is not the total damage. This is only for a few selected countries that suffered most. This is not for the entire region at all. So just to give you a snippet of how hurricane damage has been increasing in the region. The projections for annual precipitation in the Caribbean is also downward, largely. Um, the green shows the 20th century simulations. The blue graph shows the low emission scenarios by the IPCC, the SRES A2, and the high emission scenario the B2, B1, and the high emission scenario A2 is the red, which is the more likely scenario, which shows a fairly drastic projected reduction in rainfall availability in our region as we move further closer towards the end of the century. In the specific case of Barbados, we looked at projections for various time slices for the 2020s, the 2020s, 2025s, and the 2080s, and um, the 2050s, sorry, and the 2080s. And what we see here is consistent with what is being projected for the Caribbean as a whole. The most interesting thing here for us is that we are seeing projected declines. The blue graph shows current rainfall. This is observational data. The purple one, the red one shows projected. What is of concern here is that Barbados's seasons and the seasons for the islands in the Caribbean are based simply on precipitation receipt and precipitation availability. You have simply a dry season and a wet season. They're not four seasons. And the period when the rainy season, which coincides with the summertime of the year, is the period when massive, there's a massive, uh, um, there's a projected rate deficit in the rainfall. This has serious implications for farming, rain-fed agriculture, as well as water resource availability, and so on and so forth. So, so even that, from a planning perspective, the Ministry of Agriculture in Barbados, as well as the water resources entities, are using models like these and some of the projections in water resources planning, for, for instance. It becomes even more important when you put that in the context of water availability per capita in some selected Caribbean countries. You look at place, countries like Barbados, Antigua, um, St. Kitts and Nevis, where the per capita availability in terms of um, cubic meters per year is relatively low. So you're dealing with a number of countries that are already water scarce. So any further reduction in availability of precipitation is going to be problematic, particularly for countries like Barbados, which are largely limestone. So there's no surface water. You're talking about underground aquifers um, that need to be recharged as well. So reductions in um, rainfall are likely to have a negative effect on that. Um, some further work that we're doing from the climate modeling labs at the Mona campus in Jamaica and our lab at KFL, looking at sea surface temperatures, show projections in various time slices when you look at January in the two seasons we've pulled up, um, July, June, July, and August, and December, January, and February. And what we're projecting here is some further warming as we move from the 2020s right out to the 2080s. Well, how does this link now to other ecological um, characteristics of the region which are important, um, also from an economic point of view? We know that there's a strong link, well-established already, between warming of the world's oceans 
and coral bleaching. And we've see, looked at a number of major events that have occurred. The, the most intense events on record are the periods coinciding with very strong El Ninos in 1983, 1997, 98, 2005 to 2006, when there was really not an intense El Nino. But all of these coincide with periods when sea surface temperatures are around the boat or exceed one degree Celsius above the seasonal summer maximum. So bleaching of corals doesn't require high excursions of temperature at all. You only need something like one degree or less than one degree in many instances that can lead to bleaching. Um, bleaching occurs when the corals lose, because of the increased temperature trigger, lose their zooxanthellae, which is the symbiotic algae, which is critical for their, for their, um, their, their development. They lose it, they give it up, they secrete it, they pale in color. If exposed to continuous temperatures of that magnitude, only one degree or less, for about six months, morbidity sets in, and beyond that period, over about nine months to a year, mortality will occur on the reef. So that's the kind of situation which you face with the warming of sea surface temperatures. Added to that now is the issue of ocean acidification, which has been widely reported and projected. Laboratory experiments have shown, for example, that one could expect between 15 to 30 percent loss of calcification by 2030. And on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, CSIRO in Australia projects figures in excess of 40% of gasification at the current rates of acidification, ocean acidification. And of course, that is important because corals and shell organisms require um, carbonate ions to build calcium carbonate shells. Um, and obviously, as emissions increase, more CO2 is absorbed by the oceans, it becomes more acidic, which makes it more difficult for them shells, um, organisms to form shells, etc. So lobster, shrimp, and those um, shell organisms will struggle um, based on what um, we are projecting through time. Water resources, while this is not exactly coastal, um, it is important for the Caribbean because the Caribbean's water resources have always been vulnerable to fluctuations of variability in precipitation received, um, primarily through seasonal and annual availability, the impact on river flows, and through the rate of recharge of groundwater lenses. Some work done by the United Kingdom at office had this center using for their vers version two of the had cm model, showed that most of the islands in the Caribbean would be exposed, by, exposed to severe water stress um, when they combine the climate model projections with one of the FAO's hydrological models. And in fact, those results suggest that many of the islands would be unable to meet future demand by the 2050s, and some of them as early as 2025. We're already seeing evidence of this. Hence, there's a mad scramble in our region to build UNOVA desalination plants. Of course, they come with the other challenges as well. Not the cost being one of them. Again, being run on hydrocarbon fuels, so you're using more hydrocarbons to power the desal plants. And of course, desalination plants aren't as benign as we think. They actually produce waste called bread. And you have to find some way to dispose it and manage the problem. And the cases where people have just been dumping it back into the sea, fish kills have been occurring. We know fish live in sea water, but they don't like bread. So things like that have been occurring. And so there's some challenges associated too with managing desalination plants in those environments. Um, <clears throat> accelerated rates of beach erosion has been a major challenge as well. Of course, we will never argue, and we've never argued that all of the beach erosion we are seeing is related to climate change or even to global warming. Um, human beings have been the architect of a lot of the change over time, from sand mining, reef degradation, um, pollution, etc. But some empirical work in three of the, and in some of the CARICOM countries show that sea level rise is clearly a significant contributory factor. And the equation is quite simple. We know that where you have higher water levels, you're going to have higher wave amplitude, you're going to get increased wave energy, and the likelihood of more coastal erosion, accelerated erosion, is going to occur. Specifically, in recent times, three 
coastal vulnerability assessment studies, detailed studies were done for Barbados, Guyana, and Grenada, um, which are low-lying um, areas, for a project called um, Caribbean Planning for Adaptation to Climate Change. That's what the CPAC acronym is. And all of them showed that the, rate, the current rates of coastal erosion would be amplified under even marginal increases of sea level rise. Just cast your memory back again to what I said about hurricanes just a, a while ago. This is an area where we, I've done some research some 18 or so, almost 20 years ago. Many beaches recover naturally after hurricanes occur. But that depends on a number of factors. It depends on one, the extent to which the beach sediment balance can recoup, how far offshore the sediment has been carried out of the near shore zone, and the extent to which other external stimuli are not um, affecting the natural beach building process. This is a picture of South Friars Beach in the island of St. Kitts in October 1995. And I use this to illustrate the fact that, yes, be beaches do recover after a storm. But when they're hit by a series of storms repeatedly, it actually reduces their resilience and makes it more difficult for them to recover over time. South Friars Red Beach had been struck three years prior to 1995. And before it had fully recovered, then came 1995, you had Hurricanes Lewis and Marilyn, both in September 1995, within two weeks of each other. They were category fours. So prior to 1993, this beach stack, which you're seeing here, actually was not a stack, it was on the beach. The beach was actually some 15 meters in advance of where this is now. So as the beach has not been able to recover because of that barrage of impact exposure to these energy systems, where a lot of the sand has been actually carried out of the beach building system. So the sand budget is actually a negative, um, it is actually a negative sand budget right now. So this is to show you that um, depending on the, the distribution of some of these systems, it can make natural recovery very difficult as well. The question of storm surge, flood risk, and inundation is one which is serious for low lying islands of the Caribbean. Um, again, modeling has shown that by the 2080s, the number of persons facing severe floods in the regions of small island states, which are the Caribbean, Indian Ocean, and the Pacific primarily, would be about 200 times higher than if there were no sea level rise. And this was work done by a number of universities in the US, Canada, Caribbean, and in Europe. One particular study, going back to 1999 for Cuba, and Cuba, you know, is, well, we're talking about small islands, but Cuba is not exactly a small island. Cuba has a population of about 12 million, incidentally. Huge settlements, and they were able to identify some 98 coastal settlements in Cuba, each with a population exceeding about 50,000 persons, that would be almost completely inundated with a one meter level rise in sea level. Um, these photographs, show Guyana, and this is now becoming almost an annual event. This is a, the main street in Georgetown in Guyana. It is not a canal, it is the main street. This is Georgetown, the capital. Inundation and flood risk becomes even more pronounced in areas where you have other challenges like subsidence. Georgetown is actually built 1.5 meters below mean sea level. The only thing that protects Georgetown is the seawall. And if the seawall goes, of course, Georgetown goes. Of course, you, would have, you can guess who built Georgetown, the Dutch. <laughs> Guyana was initially in the Dutch hands, discovered by the Dutch, settled by the Dutch, and they've always been building polders and holding the sea back and so on. So they figured they could build another city there as well. And they did that, except that every time there's a breach in the seawall, you get deaths, you get catastrophe, etc., etc. So with increasing sea level rise, the projected impacts of places like Georgetown will be very, very severe. Um, again, if you take an example of coastal infrastructure, the case of the port of Kingston, and this is no different from other ports in the Caribbean. Um, storm surge modeling shows that a four, a category four or five hurricane will elevate your water levels by something like three to four meters, which means that this entire causeway here, 
and the port of Kingston and its installations. The port is not just the area where the ships berth, but really all the installations, really activities go on, the rural berths, the warehousing, the equipment, that's really what is critical. And um, once they become inundated and flooded, then you do have a problem. And it makes sense because if you think about the drivers for inundation and increasing water level along the coast, there are really about four of them. One, the key components are astronomical type, which is the vertical rise and fall of the ocean surface. Simply, we have set up another one, which is the increase in mean water level shore of the breaker zone caused by that flux of water at the shore. Sea level rise is a third component, and of course, sea level anomalies. And when you combine those four together, that's the recipe for increasing. Those are the key components that will drive um, water levels along coastal areas. So, apart, like other sectors, tourism, which is one of the key sectors in the Caribbean, countries like the Bahamas, for example, 95%, 90, over 90% 90 of their foreign exchange is earned from tourism, for example. That industry is not going to be um, exempt from impacts as projected by the models as well. The impact is going to be both direct and indirect. And even in terms of indirect losses, some countries are expected, are already planning diversification to counter some of the expected losses. In the case of climate-related impacts, the loss of corals through bleaching and so on, and the loss of marine flora and fauna, which now support very important industries that are annexed to the tourism industry, are important. Scuba diving. And if you thought that scuba diving was a trivial industry, it ain't. In places like Curacao and Bonaire, scuba diving nets over 700 million US dollars in foreign exchange per year, scuba diving alone on the roof. So if the reefs go because of bleaching, then you can think about, there's nothing to dive back to that, then you can think about the revenues. It's not a trivial industry, and some places, people go to Bonaire, Curacao, etc., um, simply to scuba diving because they're some of the best reefs, the most pristine um, in the world. So the temperatures, the, the, these, these changes are going to have a both a direct and an indirect effect. And you could begin to ask yourselves questions like these. If you're going to have milder temperatures in the north, how great an incentive are you going to have to travel? Our winter tourism market is the strongest market, obviously. That's because it's cold. So you guys want to come to a warmer climate for a couple of weeks and so on. Well, if temperatures were to increase um, and the winters become slightly milder, does it make sense to fly from Long Island? Why not go to Florida? So there's, there's the, the tourism planners in the Caribbean, in fact, the Caribbean Tourism and Hotel Association, for the last three years, have been having an annual conference planning diversification of their products should these eventualities occur. So they're already giving some thought to these uh, potential uh, problems. We spoke earlier about coastal infrastructure. Um, most of it is coastal because we're talking here about small islands um, and most eight places are only a couple of kilometers from the coast anyway. Um, our regional airports, seaports, etc., are all within a few kilometers of the coast. So the potential impact of sea level rise further places the infrastructure at risk. Um, and we know that the threat from sea level rise to coastal infrastructure is always amplified when you have the, tropic, the passage of tropical storms. It always increases because of the impact of storm surge. Um, you had damages, for example, as just a single hurricane in 1999, Hurricane Lenny, which caused $6 million damage, even though the storm was 250 kilometers offshore of St. Louis. So the center doesn't have even to pass over the island, but it is that strong flow of winds that creates the surge. Um, that, because, so you're, you're talking about your normal wave height. You're talking about the tidal state, the worst thing to happen is when a tropical cyclone or hurricane occurs at astronomical height because that amplifies the height. And on top of that, if you add sea level rise, you then see the impact that you have. And the impact of those, that impact is not a linear impact. So that if your normal wave setup is two meters, 
And sea level rise is half meter. It doesn't mean that the overall water level is only 2.5. It actually is multiples of that because it is a nonlinear effect through wave set up by the time the uh, surge reaches. Human health is also engaging the concern of the Caribbean Epidemiological Center through a number of um, projects, cases like dengue and malaria, for example, where a number of vectors, both, well, both vector and non-vector-borne diseases, are being driven by, change, by environmental changes, such as temperatures and so on. Um, there's also increasing evidence that the growing season of various types of pollen and other allergens are causing a higher incidence of asthma and related conditions because of the increasing temperature. Um, there are at least now a dozen papers published by um, the Faculty of Medicine at the three campuses of the University of the West Indies linking, since 1950, rates of increase in asthma, partly to increasing pollen related to temperature changes. Um, of course, there are other factors as well, but this is some of the work that is actually going on. Um, and one area of concern which has not, up to, I would say, the 70s, been a problem in the insular Caribbean, but it has been problematic in places like the Pacific for a long period of time. The question of cigatera um, fish poisoning. Cigatera occurs when you have cigatoxins flourishing under very warm seawater conditions. Um, they get into the gills of the fish, and they, the fish live, of course, the fish are fine, but if there's a large incidence of cigatera, and if humans ingest the fish, then you can become ill from that. Um, it is a problem, as I said, in many um, Pacific countries, um, and there are certain species of fish that are more susceptible to cigatera infection than others as well. I wouldn't tell you which one, because then it may stop you from eating fish certain types, but there's some very popular species up there which are very delicious as well. First choice on your menu, which I can tell you are very susceptible to see. You still want to know? You didn't hear me mention swordfish. But that is one, seriously, swordfish is one of the more susceptible to this, to the cigatoxin. But swordfish, mind you, is a very lovely fish. All right. Just an example of some work with three colleagues from the medical faculty um, at the university have been working on, Chen, Chaddy, and Rollins. They've been working on the question of dengue fever. And they've shown that dengue fever incidence can be expected to increase due to a projected two degrees Celsius increase in temperatures by the end of the century because both the abundance of the vectors <clears throat> and the transmission rate of the disease is modulated by temperature and rainfall in tandem. Um, they show, for example, that a temperature increase of 2 degrees Celsius would shorten the extrinsic incubation period of the virus from 12 to 7 days for dengue type 2. Which means that you're going to have more of um, you're shorted by half. So you're going to get more mosquitoes, which is the Aedes aegypti mosquito that causes the, the <coughs> virus that spreads it. So if you're shortening the incubation time because of these changes, you know that you're likely to have a higher transmission rate. So if you decrease that period, it would lead to a three-fold higher transmission rate of the virus. Those are the kind of the implications which the medical fraternity is also looking at. Overall, the economists are telling us that by this is some of the, the potential impact based on the models and the research we're doing, that assuming in small island, the, Carib the small island states of the Caribbean, Assuming no adaptation measures, assuming no post-Kyoto treaty, assuming that we do nothing, that by 2025, um, the loss to the, to the region would be like 40% of its GDP, right down to about 2100, when it would be about 63%. That is assuming we do nothing, we're inactive. Um, which we're not, but just to put it in some perspective as to likely uh, potential impact. And of course, the IPCC has shown, going back to the second assessment report, not only the fourth, the fourth only confirmed all this, that the regions of highest risk from global climate change and climate variability are Africa because of increasing water scarcity, food sensitivity, and so on. So that's one of the high risk areas. Asia, again, for those reasons, Latin America, and of course, the small island states. 
been identified as the most vulnerable for various reasons. That is the Pacific, the Indian Ocean group, the Atlantic group, Cape Verde Islands, Comoros, etc., and of course the Caribbean. Those four constituting the main small island regions. So those have been identified as the, age, the regions at the highest risk and whose exposure is likely to be great. For good reasons, including the fact that most of them, many of them, while they have, some of them have mountainous areas, people don't live in mountains generally. They live in the low-lying coastal areas. That's where the infrastructure is. So all of them, in all of those regions, if you look at the case of the Maldives in the Indian Ocean, this is the Malay, the capital island. There are 1,200 islands in the archipelago of the, of the Maldives in the Indian Ocean. Malay is the largest island, the capital island, lar uh, very densely populated. But what is this? This is a seawall around the entire island that had to be built at high cost to protect Malay, even from astronomical high tide. It forgets the level rise. A astronomical high tide, high spring tides, you will get rapid incursion of water into Malay. Hence, there's a seawall ringing the entire capital island called Malay. And similarly, many of the Bahamian islands, in fact, there's no island in the Bahamas that exceeds two meters above the sea level. Tuvalu in the Pacific, again, similarly, um, 1.5 meters above the sea level is its highest mountain. Um, they've already entered into an agreement with New Zealand. You probably, I don't know whether you're aware, but Tuvalu has already, they already they abandoned their currency, they use the New Zealand dollar, and they've already entered into an agreement that should sea level rise cause them to abandon the country, Australia has, um, New Zealand, sorry, has agreed that they will enter into resettlement. So that is some of the impacts that we have. There are a number of strategies, of course, that if they're implemented in a timely manner can help and reduce some of these risks. And they vary. Some are infrastructural, for example, flood protection, coastal defenses. Um, we can adapt, uh, uh, adapt and adopt various technologies in agriculture, like triple irrigation rather than traditional irrigation where we can conserve water. And of course, it calls too for some behavioral changes on our part, reduced basis of consumption of water and electricity and so on. I remember when my two daughters, as an anecdote, when they were growing up, um, long before anybody was concerned about, about um, water scar scarcity and so on in the region, I remember their mother always used to say to them, please close the faucet when you're brushing your teeth. Because I remember they would be at the sink brushing their teeth with the tap running. She said, you, when you work and you have to pay for the water yourself, you will feel it in your pocket. <laughs> and strangely enough, they're now grown adults and gone, flown the coop. But they have sort of that has been instilled and drummed into them, and they have, they have grown up with that culture. Because they dare not let their mother see them brushing the teeth. The <laughs> running. But even simple things like that, those simple behavioral changes make a difference if you multiply that by millions of people in a country where water is scarce. Um, of course, managerial approaches, changes in youth, different cultivars, for example, um, the use of salt tolerant species like halophytes and drought tolerant cultivars to replace species. And as we speak, as I mentioned, salt tolerant species um, and drought tolerant species in Guyana, Guyana's main agricultural export crop for an exchange is rice. Produces a lot of rice and exports quite a lot of it for the, most of the Caribbean. In fact, nearly every Caribbean country, apart from Belize and Suriname, import their rice from Guyana. So within CARICOM, we get our rice. What has been happening because of the fact that I mentioned Georgetown is about 1.5 meters below the sea level, but the incursions of salinity, salinity intrusion, has been salinizing the soils to the extent that the yields have been going down. And in fact, the Guyana government and the International Rice Research Institute, IRRI, have been developing various species of various cultivars now that are more soil tolerant. And they're moving now away to the Cary 14 and Cypress cultivars to other cultivars that can better tolerate salinity conditions. So this is not something which is just esoteric science that people like myself play around and fool around with. This is something affecting real people's lives. And that is happening as well. And of course, good old government policy, but things that institute and things like building codes, incentives for uses of renewable energy and so on, all of these in the mix can possibly happen. However, 
The main thing, of course, is, um, is still is no matter what we do in small island states and vulnerable countries that are high risk, they still need for a global agreement. Let's not get away from that. You can't fix a problem simply by using band-aid solutions. So the adaptation measures are fine, but I think one ultimately has to get to the source, which is increase um, higher re reductions in greenhouse gas emissions through the negotiations or increase sequestration of CO2. Either increase in forests, uh, making sure that we can absorb more of the carbon dioxide and so on. So the, that is a problem. So I think that some global agreement, which is, has been elusive up to this point, I think is something which still has to be on the carrots. And even though it is long and frustrating, nations every year still try to resolve it. But I want to highlight, finally, um, a couple of issues which are major issues in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change Negotiations. One of them is this issue of detection of impacts um, and the extent to which these impacts can be directly attributed to climate change. And that presents a great hurdle to negotiators for countries that don't want to sign the agreement because of the insistence that you must attribute every single thing. Now we know that there are very few impacts that can be shown to be singularly the result of climate change based on the current state of knowledge. So many countries are holding up that until you can show that 100% of this is attributable to, attribute to the climate change, then we're not going to do it. But even if you get past that hurdle, there's then this other hurdle here, which is a requirement to be able to quantify losses and damages associated with many systems and sectors. But again, we also know that there are multiple stressors including climate change, which are implicated in many, many areas of change. So quantification of loss and damage associated with other things like cultural assets also is problematic from the point of view of small islands. And many other societies, even if you can quantify loss of reefs, loss of fish, loss of agriculture in dollar values, how does one quantify loss of cultural assets and cultural heritage, things like traditional language, customs, etc., that may be lost if there has to be things like resettlement, uh, migration, and assimilation. And I link this back again to the comment I made earlier about Tuvalu and New Zealand. Yes, they may be physically resettled, but you would be losing a whole culture, a whole community, a whole set of languages. And Tuvalu, as small as it is, has about 27 different languages. So you're talking about things that are not easily quantifiable. But they may seem trivial to you, but they're real and important to the people of Tuvalu. That's their custom, that is part of them, that's their culture. And so how does one quantify and begin to think about these losses? I think that is very much shut Thank you very much. <laughs>
And so those, so even the, um, in, 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 in climates in the North, countries in the North are beginning to worry about these issues as well. In fact, um, I recently read an article by um, a medical lecturer um, at, it's not here in California, Anyway, but what he was saying is that the time is fast approaching where medical schools in the last few countries are going to have to begin rethinking the way they train medical students. That the concept of tropical diseases, which people thought were confined to Africa and the Caribbean and tropical countries, are now manifesting themselves with increasing temperatures and so on, as the vectors can now find favorable ecological and environmental conditions. Um, as you know, most medical doctors trained in North America and Europe couldn't identify the idea if you, if you put it in front of them as big as this site and put it in because they're not trained to detect those things. Um, schistomyosis and a lot of those diseases. So they're saying now these are no longer under projected climate change tropical diseases. These are global diseases which are going to proliferate and we have to rethink the way we train medical students at a number of a very interesting, um, I read that flight between London, back to Barbados a couple of weeks ago. It was a very interesting article. Yes, sir. You've given us several examples of the uh, countries trying to maintain the current state, building seawalls, yeah. turning to, to uh, salt and orange rice strains. Uh, can you, um, uh, or are there examples uh, of a country or some entity uh, coming up with a bold new idea and trying to uh, move ahead on that to address the issues? Uh, yes, there are a couple of countries that have decided, and, and a lot depends on the medium in which they are operating. Some countries have taken the policy decision that by some period of time in the future, in the near term, um, they will have X percentage of their energy mix coming from the U.S. Some of them, and some are actually on the road to achieve that. St. Lucia, for example, has indicated that by 2050, they expect 60% of their total energy to be provided by the U.S. That's one thing. Other countries have argued that what we will do is that as vulnerable locations become attacked by hurricanes and so on, we will not give people permits to rebuild those same vulnerable locations. Of course, that's a cost to central government because you have to provide land and subsidies and support for them. So they all come with a cost. But yes, there are countries that are beginning to rethink the policies of the The problem is, like everywhere else, including the United States, politicians and policymakers think only in a very short cycle because you get elections every four or five years. And, and so when politicians don't think about 2020 or 2030, even though that's what they should be thinking about, um, but they think in very, very short cycles. And if doing things like that are not going to get you reelected, if there's nothing sexy about building codes and relocating people out of vulnerable areas, and so you know, we vote for that answer. You know, you build highways and build roads and you do sexy things that get you vote. So lots of countries are irresponsible enough not to be thinking seriously about major policy shifts. But some countries, in fact, are actually thinking about policy shifts. Guyana, if you take the biggest huge thing, Guyana, as you know, is larger than Great Britain. Guyana is huge, but only a very tiny percentage is populated. Guyana has just entered into an agreement called, I don't know whether you've heard of it, Red, R E W E, reducing, um, yes, um, the Red Project under the UNFCCC as well. They just signed um, a 300 million US dollar project with Norway and two other. Not Western European countries, where they will preserve the forests and we stop some of the tropical forests because after Brazil, they have one of the largest tracts of tropical forests, which you know is a global good for sequestering carbon dioxide. And they have agreed for the next 99 years to leave this and harvest it pristine in return for some of this um, exchange of, of, of because those are services and capital they would have lost. By not the, the issues with it because you also have some of the indigenous population, the Amerindians, living in the interior of the forest. 
And the data to be going into is how do I also make sure that they benefit from this group? I think that is a great challenge too. Um, and that is occupying the cycle. So there are a couple of things which are who is not the innovative and they have. But not in the positive in the sense. I should preface my question by saying that I grew up in Trinidad and Tobago, so I'm a little bit biased about information regarding them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just wanted to know uh, if you could speak towards total land loss in the Caribbean in general, and uh, if the Caribbean uh, has an agreement such as uh, uh, the one established with New Zealand and uh, I can't remember the Maldives, but it's Tuvalu. Tuvalu, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of relocation, especially as devastating hurricanes become more prevalent in the Caribbean. Uh, well, <clears throat> the first part of the question, coastal land loss is indeed a problem. Um, as you get accelerated erosion, and let me say that erosion is a part of the natural coastal process and cycle, so it isn't something that is external. But there's usually there's a balance between the rate of natural geological erosion and the rate at which um, beaches and so on build back. What we're seeing, however, is now an increasing consistent trend over time. So, um, in fact, I, mean, I can produce figures for you showing the amount of land loss based not only on um, observational data from beach profile measurements, but also from satellite image records where you can actually map the coastal change and the, the, the coastal land loss. So that is available. Yes, that is becoming a problem. But there are no such agreements um, with similar to that in Tuvalu for any of the Caribbean countries. Of course, Tuvalu is smaller than any of the Caribbean countries anyhow, and um, so there's not that, um, there, there, there's not the perception of such an imminent kind of threat. So nothing like that has been pursued. The only thing that ever came near had nothing to do with climate change and climate variability, and that is with the island of Montserrat, which you know of because of the eruption of the volcano. Um, Montserrat is still a dependency of Great Britain, and they carry British passports, and they're free to move backward and forward because they know. At one point, the country was basically shut down because of the eruption of the volcano. So you only need one hazard event of a certain magnitude in a, on a small island, and you can disrupt the whole, the whole island. Actually. But no, there's no such agreement in the case of the insular Caribbean. I thought I saw another hand up. Yes. Um, Quick question. You were talking about uh, the water stress that is happening and will be um, we increase with the, the decreasing precipitation and less recharge, but is there any consideration about the additional stress that seawater level rise is going to create for uh, groundwater resources by uh, seawater intrusion? Yes, yeah, I, I thought I didn't mention um, salinity intrusion into yes. groundwater aquifers. That is actually becoming problematic. And I can give you um, examples. In the case of Barbados, two of the main wells that supply water to the West Coast, Henry knows the West Coast pretty well of Barbados. Um, at times of the year, the combination of sea level rise plus the rate of abstraction of water from those aquifers increases the salinity intake. And as a result, those wells have to be closed sometimes for three to four months of the year. Um, so that ambient levels can be reached before they open the market. So that's taken into account. Yes, so they take, they, yes, they, they take it, yes. So the way they manage those wells is that they now have it down to a pretty fine level. They now know about when they should stop pumping those wells because um, the, of the likelihood of salinity intrusion. So those wells are only functional effectively for adding to the augmenting water in Barbados on the West Coast for about eight or nine, eight months a year. So. I think we'd uh, probably like to move down to the Kubo room if we want to continue some discussions. Thank you, Dr. Nurse, for. <laughs> uh, I should mention, if you don't know about it, the State University of New York and the University of West Indies have an agreement to develop joint research and educational programs, and they're just uh, put out some seed money for such projects. Well,